Hi, I'm Nick. I'm Natasha. <laughs> well, we started to call it the Model N for Nick and Natasha. <laughs> um, but we don't know if that's really going to stick or what. Our handle, our Instagram handle is Uproot and Rome, R-O-A-M. I don't know. That's what, that's what we came up with. I don't, know. I don't know. We like calling it the Model N. Yeah, the Model N is We good. call the bus right. the Model N. The bus is a... Uh, 2004 Bluebird All-American with a Caterpillar 3116 engine, and it's diesel. Um, we have the front engine with the doghouse on the inside. Actually, I think we're regretting that because it's really loud when we're driving. I think if we could redo it, we would choose an engine in the back, a pusher. I guess I think we redid the stairs so that we could get a little bit more insulation out of it. And then also just to kind of shore everything up and make it look nice and the same uniform, I guess. We're going to remove everything that's down there. One of the reasons it was just in a not a good state. It was just kind of gross. So, and then we wanted to get more insulation, like Nick said. So we're from Wisconsin and we're going to be chasing the sun as much as possible, but we will be back in Minnesota, Wisconsin area during cold periods. So every little bit is going to count. Obviously we decided to chose to keep a lot of the windows in the bus. So we're going to lose a lot of heat through those, but we're going to try to shore up everything else. With the engine up front, we do get a lot of heat. One of the reasons is we, when we put the floor in, it raised up the doghouse. So we're getting some heat coming in around it. We plan to trim. This is just like a fiberglass doghouse. 65% complete, yes. <laughs> so we have the floor to finish and um, we'll do a little trimming. It'll be tighter. And then we did notice with the wood floor and the heat coming in around the doghouse that it's drying out our engineered hardwood floor and causing it to crack. We got the floor for free. It's a beautiful hickory and I don't think I would do something different just because it was offered up to us, but it is something to consider with the cracking. Just make sure to insulate it, I guess. Mm -hmm. or be mindful of it if you're not quite complete. Yeah, if we could secure it down, I think it would be much less heat and I'd w I think it won't do any damage once we get that kind of cut down and secured in place. It does make us a lot more aware of what's going on up here. So the first time we broke down, we had a really loud fan and then a big squealing noise. And if the engine was in the back, we might not have been as aware of that. Yeah, we our water pump seized up in Nashville on our like second day on the road, third day on the road. So we fortunately we had AAA, so we got towed for free. And in that first tow, it already paid for itself. AAA already paid for itself, so that was good. And then they told us that we had a seized up water pump, and he just said, you know, you're gonna expect to have another issue or two in the next few weeks, months, and once you go through those issues like it'll be a hard part to go through but once you go through them um, you'll be good on the other side of it you'll last for a long time yeah our water temperature gauge is off right now so it's actually like bouncing around a lot so we've been fiddling with it just trying to figure out how to like fix it and we had a like duct tape concoction that was working for a little while but in the end we just need to like go in there and probably um, cut the cables and like re make the connection stronger again. It's been really critical for us to realize the importance of those gauges. Mm -hmm. um, we hit our first 7% grade a week or so ago and we hadn't practiced downshifting the bus. We have an automatic transmission and by the time we got to the bottom we had a billow of smoke coming out of our brakes. <laughs> So important thing to note is like practice downshifting before you get to a big hill and then also watch your air pressure gauge right. um, because you can't ride the brakes or they'll fail. But if you kind of watch how much pressure you have, you can slow down 10 miles per hour at a time and then just kind of do that five seconds at a time to slow down. So the other day we were going up a steep grade and we noticed that as we got closer to the top, fan. backup fan, whatever I it don't is. Know, the loud in. fan. And that's just, I mean, that's to be expected, I think, uh, in really hot climates like here. <laughs> and when you're going up uh, a steep hill and you're putting the engine through some like, you know, hard uh, situation, 
you're gonna encounter some of that like the backup fan will kick on and like just dissipate that heat as much as possible driving the bus is it's been a learning experience like <laughs> driving 40 feet like i've never driven anything this big and and then you're in front of the wheels as well so i think just getting used to that like make it easy on yourself to start off with like you know don't put yourself into too difficult of a circumstance to start with allow yourself to like get comfortable i didn't get comfortable until we were like 3,000 or 4,000 miles into this you know trip so um so it takes a while like <laughs> It's not like a car. There's just no similarities uh, to it. There's just a lot of like rocking that happens. So what we learned really quickly is that our cabinets needed to have some kind of extra like thing that's gonna hold them in place. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what style stoppers you got. So I just got some roller clips. Where were we at? Lowe's? Lowe's, yeah. Put one on each drawer and realized I probably am gonna need two to get it, keep it from slamming open when you turn corners. It's not, an, it's not a problem on the interstate when we're going fast. It's more so when we're in town and we're making turns. And we removed the front panel um, because of our roof rack, actually. We needed access to the rib or the beam that's right here. Um, we bolted on, and you'll see from the outside, the vertical supports. So we didn't really want to take it out. It was probably the hardest piece that we took out involving the roof. The roof, you just kind of, we used an air hammer to get all the, the rivets part, out. Yeah. Yep, the right. ceiling. Um, we just use a air compressor with a little bit, two bits, one to punch out the rivet and then the other one to um, shear it off mm -hmm. like a chisel and the front didn't have that i think we ended up using the angle grinder to cut some of the rusty bolts that we yeah. couldn't get out and it's just kind of like built in the the front piece was all one piece and it was just kind of built into both of the sides so you couldn't like get one side up and then kind of like wiggle it out or anything but we were also worried about we gutted everything down to the bare skin and we were really worried about rust because we got this bus from detroit and and it's just you know they deal with rust you know they deal with a lot of a lot of elements so we just wanted to gut it and get it like see what our like situation was and it ended up being like a good thing because then we understood exactly where there were leaks and we were able to patch it and mostly that was the floor like there's a lot of patches that we need to do on the floor but we feel like we got it we did a good job with it thermal bridging was also a big concern we didn't want that raw metal to be exposed to the sun and have that transfer to the inside so we pretty much covered everything possible with foam i mean except for where you see around some of the windows we tried to cover everything and we also tried not to screw right into the ribs so that we weren't getting the transfer of heat and if we did we covered it with wood or foam we chose the spray foam for a couple different reasons one because it's a vapor and air <coughs> barrier it's also rigid so it adds structure i was concerned that it wasn't a super environmentally safe option um, but it had those other benefits the other thing is it was the most our value that we could get for that smallest space so we had like two inches to work with and we could get like a 13 or 14 R value out of that whereas everything else was like 10 or 9 or 8 I think More, we ended up like with like two, two inches. all the way around so we did the ceiling we did the walls up to the bottom of the windows and then we did all the floor to prepare it, we we cut, they're just quarter inch strips that go all the way along. And then we couldn't curve it quite as much, so we cut little pieces along there and we used, what do they call them? Like self-tapping screws. Mm -hmm. Torx. Torx. And then we used quarter inch ceiling planks and we used finishing nails on that. And I should point out that it's really critical to use construction adhesive to also glue the ceiling on or your nails will come loose and gaps will form between the boards because they shrink down. And I can show you back by our shower where we have really big gaps where we didn't put the glue. Yeah, the tongue and groove was easy. We got it at Home Depot. It came in packs and we I don't know. It was, it went pretty fast once we got the hang of it. The hardest part was just that it's so thin, we didn't have a great way to get the nails set in. So we had to put the nail gun at a really low pressure and it just caused the issues for us to, so we ended up coming back on a lot of the nails and hammering them in with a hammer. There's um, one nail set. here. So you can see like, yeah, they're sticking out in some places. Um, we just have to nail set them in. Hold we up. haven't had a problem with it though. It's, it looks no. great. We'll probably end up whitewashing it filling in the nail holes and 
just make it a little bit lighter. I know it's already light colored, but. We got the lights on Amazon. They're little LED with the built-in transformer. The wiring is, I mean, we're doing all alternating current throughout the bus, and that was just mostly for simplicity, and we have enough battery and we have enough electricity, so we're good to go there. So we used 14.2 like Romex wire to go to the lights, and that's pretty standard. We watched a lot of YouTube videos, and just tried to see what other people had done in a normal house build, because that's kind of what we were going for, was just a normal house build. Then, I don't know, we just wired them up. We don't have a junk box uh, which we double checked and made sure that we felt really comfortable with uh, I'm not sure an electrician would recommend it but sure an electrician would not recommend it but but we're doing it and I think you know most people said like yeah you're dealing with such a small amount of current that it shouldn't be an issue and then we had these little um, wire connectors Wago lever nuts right and those are amazing they were really great for uh, hooking up the light to the Romex wire there, 14-2 wire, and you can just like snap them in place. And then if you ever need to like take the light out for some reason and like do some work, you can easily just like, unsnap them and then disconnect them. And then later on when you want to put it back in, you can you can re-snap them together, so. We ordered a couple extra everybody, in case one went bad. Right, everybody loved them. They were a really big hit when we posted a photo of those on Instagram, so I think we learned about it from our landlord where we were living at. So the floor construction is two by twos framed out. And I think we did two, like three sections. Mm -hmm. And we did the framing so that we could put the spray foam down. It needed a way to like hold up the next layer, which is OSB particle board. And then on top of that, we have insulament padding and it's the same thickness as about an eighth of an inch thick to match the, we have thermostat yep. floor heat mats that are electric. And so anywhere we didn't put the heat mats, we put the insulament, which is the same product without the wire in it, the heating wire. And then on top of that, we put our half inch hickory tongue and groove. One thing to look out for while you're putting those in, and this system was really great because it comes in a pre-cut sized mat, and so all you have to do is roll it out. When you're putting in your floor on top of it, it can sit right on top of it. They said not to use glue, so we did nails um, throughout, but you still have to look out for the heating wires that run throughout. You don't want to pierce those. If you pierce that, you've essentially like killed your floor. Um, you can't use it. So that was a little bit of a just like be cautious while you're doing it. We have them all laid out and we have the connections all made. We just need to finish the connection to the main panel so that we can actually run it. So we don't know exactly like, is it gonna be great or not? Like we're not exactly sure, but it's a low draw. So, and with our setup, we have so much battery that we shouldn't have any problem with it. I think it's only like, an amp or two per heating mat, depending on how big of a heating mat it is. It's really small. They're really efficient. It won't keep us warm in winter weather. It's like literally just to add some warmth to the floor. <clears throat> Arizona in the winter, we can get a little bit of heat. I think if we run those, so we have two up here and then we'll have, I don't know, like. We have four zones. We've got 10 mats all together. Right, two mats in the front. We have a mat in each of the underbody storage boxes. And then we have a zone up on top of our bed platform and another like where the shower and the bathroom are. And I um, think if we run all those all night, you know, if it's 30 degrees, it'll stay comfortable in here. Um, and I don't think it's gonna like stay hot in here, um, but 30 degrees with those running, that should be good. Um, for anything colder than that, I think we're gonna have to run a little propane uh, heater. I forgot to mention, the floor framing, the two by twos are screwed together and then they're glued down with construction glue. And then it's essentially just floating other than the glue. In a couple places, we screwed it to the frame of the walls. Um, we didn't wanna add any more holes into the floor than we had to. We do get a little bit of bowing. The floor is definitely uneven, um, but it worked out fine doing the flooring in this kind of like lengthwise of the bus. So nothing square. The couch is my pride and joy. <laughs> <laughs> I built it in one day. Well, I should say two because the slats took a little bit longer. 
the foam is just a memory foam queen size mat that I cut down and I'll probably cut it in half at some point so there are two pieces so this is hinged in the back right here and then it also pulls out maybe ah, there's a design flaw here it hits the countertop so I'll have to change something there but we have storage underneath and I can show the other side to see what the wheel well looks like four of the wheel wells are the same they're framed out with two by twos and then the foam was kind of sprayed after the framing went in that's essentially all we really had to do to prepare them I wanted the couch to go down a little like not all the way to the end of the the wheel well so I'm going to build an arm on the end with a cup holder in the top so that when you're resting and relaxing on the drive you can put your cup in there there'll also be an outlet on the front there but I wanted to make sure that it didn't look weird with the wheel well sticking out the end it was pretty straightforward I saw a picture on Pinterest on how to build something like this one thing I did realize is the slats need to be square in order to pull out easily it kind of gets stuck right now because it's not completely square and we chose we saw some people do thicker slats wider slats and with this soft foam I thought it would you'd be able to feel it more so we chose a small I don't know this is like a one and a half inch slat I did get some cracking so it's important to drill and then I put this little corner on here a little angle so that you could walk by and that's kind of it hasn't really worked well it's kind of falling apart so I have to fix that but I'll figure it out the design up here the kennel for her for Tesla is going to be about half of what it is now to about here and then there'll be a desk up front for one of us uh, and I designed the space very intentionally with two separate spaces one for Nick up front and one for me in the back so that we can really focus and dig into work we're both software engineers and we need that quiet time so there'll be a nice desk up here and then I can kind of tell you about the kitchen design we went with 24 inch cabinets because we have the washer dryer here which is designed to go in a situation like this and then the fridge on the other side was 24 inches but I think I'd recommend if you don't have big appliances to put in to do 24 on one side and 15 on the other if you do a layout like this and you'd have a little bit more space we really haven't had trouble like passing by each other and stuff in here everything's from Ikea the cabinets we went this route because we were in a rush if we had more time I think I would have built them ourselves out of solid wood we've been on the road for a month they're holding up great they look great yeah I like them a lot they are built pretty well like the doors are heavy but they're definitely not solid wood I mean they're probably lighter weight as well uh, the sink is from Ikea and this was a very intentional decision too to go with this size we read that a lot of people had a single well sink that was really small and they didn't like it and that the sink is a great place to just throw things when you're driving so we have a cover for this actually so that we can use it as countertop space but we have plenty we have tons so we'll have a faucet we also got that from Ikea um, all the plumbing is roughed in in the walls right now it's just not hooked up yet and then I made our countertops it's a maple I think a maple veneer and then along the edges I glued on a piece of solid maple to cover that striped look on the edge of the plywood um, and we haven't finished them yet we've been debating what we're going to use I think I'll end up just doing like polyurethane or something and we're going to stain them dark it'll be part of the design so the floors are light all the wood will be dark including the couch and the desk the back and the front the washer dryer was a sort of last minute decision um, we added it in <laughs> towards the end I think we just didn't want to go to the dry cleaners all the time or the laundromat and we've since been to a couple laundromats and it's fine it's actually kind of great we meet people just washing their laundry and chat and I kind of regret buying it now but we don't have it hooked up so we haven't used it yet we didn't have like all the plumbing in 
we might love it. It does take a long time, so this is a washer dry combo unit by Magic Chef. I ordered it online, I think from Home Depot and got it delivered to the house where we did the conversion. The reviews say with a heatless dryer that it takes a lot longer to dry and since the clothes come out cold that it doesn't feel dry, but I think it's just a learning curve. So we'll try it and see. I think we'll be happy once we're actually using it. So the plumbing comes in the wall down underneath. It stops at the washer dryer hookup and the drain. And then it comes up and around here. You can see the cold water line comes here. The cold water line also goes in to the water heater. We have a sediment filter here to protect the water heater. And then this is actually, it's an on off valve obviously. And then you can run through like vinegar water and stuff to clean the water heater if it's not being as efficient as possible. And then the hot line comes out this side. It runs over to the shower head here. And then it also goes down to the washer dryer, back into the wall to the sink. And we also have a sink plumbed in our bathroom as well. And then this is an Eco Smart 8, eight kilowatt hour water heater. And it's completely electric. We had to get a pretty large inverter to support a system like this. So uh, we wouldn't recommend it to everyone unless you really have a big setup. The inverter that we got is as big as I've seen uh, anybody have. I don't know if I've seen anybody with a bigger inverter. It's a 6800 watt constant and then it can surge to 8500 watts for an hour and up to 12,000 watts for 60 seconds. Eight kilowatts, so at any given moment, the number on the side is gonna say like eight, but how much it actually is in practice, we don't know. Like uh, the reality of it is, is I don't think we're gonna right. know until we actually set it up because with anything, you it will depend on like, how hot do you have it set? Is it like all the way open, you know? Or is it like, you just need a little bit of heat, you know? So you have it, the temperature set pretty low. So I think it's all gonna depend just kind of our usage and, and a lot of playing around and figuring it out. I assume it's rated for eight kilowatts in a single hour at a particular temperature. So if we average a seven minute shower, we should be just fine, like complete within our means of, we're not gonna use even close to eight kilowatts. We chose to have one source of energy that would run everything in the bus besides just the regular bus gauges and stuff like that, um, that all run off of the the bus batteries, kind of the default batteries that the bus comes with. Um, so yeah, we chose to just do everything off of solar. So we sized it to be as big as what we thought we would ever need at the maximum, which would give us like pretty much all the heat we would need, air conditioning, um, which are typically your two biggest uh, draws in your house. And so we just kind of made every decision based off of that. It was like, all right, well, we're gonna get the biggest solar uh, that we can get so that we can be off grid for a long time, maybe indefinitely. Um, we do have the ability to set up with shore power if we want to, our inverter will accept it. Um, we just don't need it necessarily. And then we made every decision after that, like, okay, well, how much hot water do we want? We gotta get an electric hot water heater we're gonna do an on-demand instead of a tank try to save a little bit of the electricity by getting on-demand instead of a tank and then you know we need a big inverter we need significant amount of batteries so yeah all the decisions kind of just cascade <laughs> in that process we made a spreadsheet with a list of all the appliances that we have in the house including like our laptops our toaster oven our crock pot the blow dryer the fridge the the washer dryer the water heater like anything we could think of we put it in a list in the spreadsheet and in that spreadsheet we had the amps that it draws the kilowatt hours if it was listed the voltage all of that and we calculated out what it would take for our system to run and we actually ordered the EcoSmart 11 and realized at that point we couldn't handle that, so we downgraded to this one. Uh, and we obviously haven't tried it yet because the plumbing's not hooked up. But yeah, we'll definitely, once we get it hooked up, let everybody know how it works. 
the other decision that we made was even if we didn't have the electric hot water heater, we were still going to have a hookup for an electric car um, so that we could actually power an electric car if we wanted to. We could tow it. We haven't decided to, to get that, pull that trigger yet, but um, once we do, we have all the capabilities to be able to power an electric car. And so then we could tow that, take that off and tool around town and then come back and then charge it back up on our, on our solar and our batteries. Then we can still use the electric hot water heater. We can use the electric for the for the car and we don't have to change or we didn't have to have multiple systems for that. We could just have one system that would do both of them. So along with the decision to go away from propane and just do electric, we got an induction cooktop and that essentially just means that it uses a magnet to heat just pans instead of the cooktop itself. It's more efficient. There are some little quirks to having this. It's noisy. I'll just turn it on so you can hear it. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it. Um, we talked to the modern day adventurers and they said there's a high pitched squeal that it makes that he didn't like and we've witnessed it. It is a little bit noisy, but I love it so far. We literally have two pans and our water kettle. We can pretty much do everything with that. So when you live in a small space, you obviously need to have just a few things to get along. Uh, when my mom was traveling with us, we got a coffee pot. She insisted and we like it, so we're keeping it. And then we have a toaster oven, which is convection, just means it has a fan in it, and we cook everything in that. All of our Tupperware, our storage containers for our food can go right in the oven and have lids, so we have everything glass. And here's kind of what our drawer looks like. Plates, bowls, I think we brought more than we needed. I brought a set of six, mm -hmm. and it's too much. We don't need all of that. I also brought pint glasses and stuff, which we also don't need. We shop at the co-op, buy things in bulk, and if we ever have guests and we need extra glasses, we can use the pint glasses. This is, what do they call this, shelf liner? And I'm not really that proud of it because it is like a synthetic, I don't know, plastic or rubber product. I'd prefer to use something natural. I think you could just use some napkins, napkins like cloth napkins to separate them. But what I'm learning is we actually don't need these in between the dishes. They don't rattle that much when we're driving. So for some of like the more delicate big things that might rattle, yes, but for the most part, you don't really need it. We have two drawers for dishes. This is like the main things that we eat off and store the food in. So when I mentioned this is what we put our food in, it can go right in the toaster oven and in the fridge and they have lids. So we have a couple different sizes of those, which we love. We have a couple of coffee cups and that's all we really need. And then down here we have pans. We have a little tiny food processor, which I make um, banana ice cream with, like corningware, white dishes that fit right in there. We can make casseroles and eggs and oatmeal and everything in the toaster oven. I really love that. And then our refrigerator. So we have a side-by-side, -side, which everybody loves. Refrigerator on the right, freezer on the left. And we fit everything we need in here. We haven't had a big issue with this yet. It's very efficient. I think 300 kilowatt hours per year for this guy, which, I mean, it is pretty small. I think it's a five and a half cubic foot, and but it gets everything that we need. And you, it's hard to find anything that's more energy efficient than that, unless you go with like one of those tiny dorm room fridges, and those are just not enough. There would yeah. no way that we'd be able to survive off of that, so. We have additional food storage back by our, back here, we'll have a pantry, for now, we have food stored in our kitchen drawers. We have a drawer for hand towels and rags and spices. Another for utensils, um, a couple like miscellaneous sized things. Um, the bottom drawer currently has food in it. I think I thought that we would need more space for dishes, but we don't. So we may just keep food in it and use the pantry for storage. Um, if we're gonna go off grid for a month or so, that would be an extreme case, I guess. But if we were to do that, we would probably have to stack the fridge and freezer pretty full on our way out and then have a lot of dry stuff um, mm -hmm. to supplement. We eat a lot of fresh food and fruits and vegetables will last. We just put all of our fruits and veggies in the sink, uh, like potatoes, anything like grapefruit, 
Obviously bananas won't last, but there's a lot of fresh stuff that we could keep in here for a month. Right. We don't have the funds to do it right now, and it's not really in our, like, we're just trying to explore as much uh, right now and just see, you know, how traveling works for us. But once we're kind of settled into it and we have a little bit more room to work with, I think we'll We'll get something that we can totally we handle. did a test drive of a fiat 500 electric and we like it it's really powerful and fun to drive but i we were just kind of trying to see if we need it we have two bikes and we haven't really ventured out to the grocery store on our bikes but it's possible yeah we have a lot of stuff that we need to finish up before we can start thinking about like what's our next project that we're gonna like start <laughs> like scratch you know because there'll be a lot involved with towing a car like we're gonna have to get we'll have to get some type of a hitch installed on the back and we'll have to make sure that we you know we have to buy a good car <laughs> make sure that that's like a solid purchase and that requires money and that requires time and I just think we're not quite ready for it. Maybe in the next year we'll buy something, but I don't think it's at the top of the priority list. And we'll have right? to decide like what type of tow dolly or trailer that we mm -hmm. use. With the research we did on the electric cars, it had to at least have two wheels off the ground. Some, like you can't have it in neutral in order to charge it or something. For the Fiat 500D, you had to have the front wheels specifically off the ground. And, and so you could do, you know, a front tow dolly or you could do a trailer. We could charge in transit. Okay. Um, I think if we were on a trailer, I think that wouldn't be an issue. I don't know if we could charge in transit with a tow dolly, uh, the front wheels off the ground. We took out the emergency exits um, because they were literally falling apart from sun exposure. When we were building the roof rack, my dad like pulled on it and it pretty much fell apart. So they were very brittle. They were brittle, yeah. So we took them out and then we had big holes in the roof. We thought like, what's a quick solution to cover them up? Um, so we just bought some plexiglass and used the existing holes that were there to screw them in. And then the framing that you see around the windows was maybe more complicated than it needed to be. But I just put some quarter inch plywood all the way around and then some little furring strip two by twos to fasten on a fish finishing piece when we finally get to that to make it look, you know, nice and finished. Uh, it's just plexiglass over the opening with screws, easy. So for the shower, we put this plastic. I think the plastic starts like right around here. You can kind of see. <laughs> so the plastic was put down and then we nailed through the plastic into our furring strips. There's a metal crossbeam right here. You can see that these are the places where we weren't able to put glue because the glue went to be adhered to the plastic and it's starting to pull away a little bit. I don't know, it's that glue really just gave it that extra little bit to hold it in place. Prevented the boards from shrinking. The construction glue did. So if you do a tongue and groove sealing, make sure you use a construction adhesive. We used Loctite Premium three time and it's awesome. In cold weather, it worked great. It dries really solid and hard. I used the Loctite Premium on the floor when we when I did the two by two framing in the floor to glue it down. We used it on the ceiling. We used it on the subfloor. Any place that we needed glue, I used that. It seemed really solid. I tried a couple other things. The subfloor specific Loctite, but it just didn't dry as hard. And there are different levels of Loctite that you can try. Part of it was we were dealing with uh, Wisconsin weather. And so we were just trying to figure out what would work for us at the moment um, and it was like November December time frame. We purchased a kit for the shower from Home Depot and because we needed something really quick we planned on getting this done before we hit the road but we obviously didn't accomplish that. Um, so it's just like PVC or really thin plastic that you glue onto the studs. We are planning to put cement board in prior so there'll be a vapor barrier over the studs and then the cement board will be screwed in and then on top of that we will glue the shower surround to that. You can see I have like roughed in the shower head or actually the, the plumbing mechanism there but not the shower head yet. We sunk the bathtub down into the floor and I don't know if this was a great decision on our part, but it was a fun experience. Um, so we cut a hole in the metal in the floor and had to patch like some of the rust as well around that. And then after that, I framed around it with the two by twos, obviously, and we did the foam. And then we came back and we attached slotted angle steel um, around the edges and 
mounted a framing system for our bathtub down into the floor, we gained three inches. I thought we'd gain more. We could gain up to 10 inches, but due to the plumbing needing to be a downward slope for gravitational draining, we only gained three inches, but hopefully we'll be happy and proud that we have the extra three inches. The alternative would be to add a sump pump to the drain so we can put it down lower. And that seems like a common practice to do in RVs. So we'll consider that when we actually decide to finish it out. And the tub is actually a mop sink. So it's a, a three foot by two foot mop sink and we're gonna build up the ledge around it. I don't know, we might end up just putting like a tiled ledge around the tub. And then the tub sits inside of our underbody storage box. So it's protected from the elements, all of our plumbing connections and all that will be protected. And then we have a 100 gallon gray water tank that sits right below the tub so that way the water from the tub will drain out and it'll just go gravity mm -hmm. fed into uh, the gray water tank. I don't think it's a problem. I think if we were doing anything worse than shower sink stuff, that's all like natural stuff. And we're even planning on getting some like natural uh, soaps. So then, you know, you go into a gray water tank and then from there, I think we could release it pretty much anywhere. I mean, it's basically just rainwater at that point, you know, like maybe not the cleanest, but also like something that just occurs. So. We don't want to get in trouble either though. Right. And with that like bus stigma, like the people living inside of buses don't have a great reputation. Right. We want to follow the rules, but we also, <clears throat> I don't want to dump clean, like clean, I mean like organic material into a waste dump thing with a bunch of crap in it. It doesn't make sense. It's also in pretty smooth transition into the fact that we have a composting toilet. So we use coconut core um, to mix with our solids and you just stir it after you go number two. And the, the liquid waste is separated. It keeps it from turning into a gross mess. The urine is sterile, so you can dump it in the environment, but there is that like controversy about whether it's acceptable. So Right. I think we just need to be conscientious and like, you know, realize where we're at, whether we feel comfortable mm -hmm. dumping the gray water someplace. And there is a way to do it, right? Since it's acidic, you kind of like, right. as long as you spread it and you don't let it puddle, it should be okay. So basic framing here, similar to the other wheel wells. We did this just because you'll always be sitting when you're up there. Tall people obviously have a little issue when they're standing on the wheel well. But we do plan to put some storage in behind this so the toilet will be pushed a little bit farther forward. And we love the toilet so far. We, I think if we had more time, we would have considered building our own. Yeah. A Nature's Head composting toilet is the brand, but you can buy a diverter and build your own if you want. We empty the urine container once a day. It's at about half full once a day. And it's hard to find a spot to dump it, but we recently received advice. If you have like a dedicated bag that you can carry it in, you can always take it inside and dump it in a toilet when you're in downtown, when there's not like a place that you could dump it safely without getting in trouble in the wilderness. But all of the material, since it's separated, is safe and sterile. And I've watched a lot of reviews that it's really easy to maintain and clean it, but it's actually a little harder than I thought. I've emptied it once so far. We empty the solids about once a month and we've only been traveling for about a month. So I would definitely recommend it. We have a little fan connected that is essential to dry out the solid container and we just have it plumbed through the window for now but if I think down the road we need to make it a little bit more sustainable we could definitely either drill a hole in the side of the liquid container down to a tank underneath in our storage bin or potentially take the, the liquid container out and plumb it directly to a container underneath. And that would be definitely way more manageable than doing it every day. Yeah, we dump it every day. We, I don't wanna dump it when it's all the way full. Um, it just gets it just really, feels awkward. It gets really heavy too. Like that's it doesn't of, smell good either. <laughs> it's been better so lately. We have to, dumping it, once a day when it's half full and then rinsing it and putting some vinegar in there helps. It's a process. Um, <laughs> it's not been um, the easiest 
change up. I mean, you start to realize that like, you know, what are the conveniences that you have at home that are really nice and a toilet is nice. Now, a toilet does use a lot of water, so there is that disadvantage. I do want to point out our framing like our choice of framing. So I went with the traditional wall style framing here where the two by fours go, you know, the direction that you see, but you can also choose to do like boat construction where they go the other way. And I just didn't know it was an option, but we met the modern day adventures. I've mentioned them a few times cause we love them and they did theirs the other way. So on the back side of this, I think I'll try some of it. But for those of you that want to utilize storage inside of the walls, I can show you on our wall over here we I actually framed it out so that we can have one section for him one for me where you kind of open up a piece of art like as a door on it and then we'll have storage inside so if you plan before you've actually built the walls what kind of storage you want inside it's actually a pretty neat way to do that and have some extra storage i also wanted to mention before we moved into the bus we were toying around with buying soaps and things in bulk at the co-op so it's actually really easy to do get like organic soaps and not have a lot of trash and you just bring like a ball jar in whatever size that you want and you fill up dish soap uh, shampoo, conditioner, lotion, everything, you can get everything there. And then you don't have to throw away the containers that you typically buy at like Target or Walmart. And we do this with all of our food and our spices now. You can get taco seasoning or make your own. And we're really conscious of all of the trash that we have and the containers we throw away because we've found that it's really hard to recycle when you're on the road. And each community recycles different things. So in some communities, it's easier to recycle glass, some easier for aluminum, so on and so forth. So we've just been really conscious of how much trash that we make. Plastics around pretty much forever. It's about, I think it's 90% more efficient to manufacture plastic or not plastic, glass, aluminum, things like that from recycled material as it is to like mine it and make it brand new. It's less efficient with plastic. I think it's like 60% more efficient to use recycled, but it makes a big difference. So if you can't recycle it, you know, choose glass and reuse it, you know, refill it. We chose to go, well, I think first off, like doing a solar project is like maybe the coolest thing. Like I think about as I was a kid growing up, like dreaming about doing something cool with like a solar, even in high school or not high school, like junior high, I remember we built these like solar cars and you had like a little tiny solar, like cut out little piece of solar and you put it on your car and then it would run this little tiny motor. And like my mind was blown by it. I was just like, that's the coolest thing ever. And then you see all these like projects and you see all the big like solar farms as you're driving along. And it's so, it still captures that kid in me that thinks that's so cool. And now we've done it. And that's the raddest thing. I can't believe that we've actually made this thing come true. Like <laughs> The moment we turn the lights on, and we were like, oh my God, right. it worked. Just losing it. We got uh, eight solar panels. We purchased eight solar panels. That's what's on our roof. That's the most like striking thing that people see when they drive past it. It's the thing that everybody's like, holy cow, like amazing roof rack. Is that all solar? Eight panels that are 345 watts a piece. We have 2,760 watts. And we did that not knowing all of the rest of the ramifications, but we knew that like we were gonna make everything work together. So we got our solar. So that's all on the roof. Roof. We have those connected in two in series, and then we have four sets of two up on the roof. And then we have a cable gland that we cut a hole in the side of our bus here, and we attach this cable gland, and that is what we're running the eight wires through. So four positives and four negatives um, come through this cable gland. And it's essentially like, I don't know, maybe you can describe it. I Well, I was just gonna say like we were really conscious of the number of holes that we put in the roof. This is the only hole that we put in. Right. Really, this is the only hole we've drilled in there. Right. And so essentially what it is, it's almost like conduit where it attaches from the back and it's kind of clamped onto the metal and it has little holes in it that you actually puncture when you put the wire through and then you tighten it up to make the make it really, I, I don't know how to explain it. The holes seal up, um, it's really tight. There's no way that any water is coming through there. It's just so tight. And the the gland is like four bucks or something. It's super cheap, it's super amazing. Cheap. It's so great. We got it online, I can't remember 
the name of the place we got it, but you can get different sizes, different number of wires going through. This is a one inch MPT connection, mm -hmm. um, or hole I should say. <clears throat> I could look to see where we got it from. We got some 12 gauge photovoltaic wire that's rated like 105 degrees Celsius, um, which I think is on the higher end of the spectrum for ratings. So that just talks about like how thick the sheathing is around the wire itself, and what temperature that that can handle. And so we went higher, um, which is better. And then that all comes together into a combiner box. This combiner box takes all of those individual connections, the four individual connections from the roof, and brings them all into uh, one positive and one negative. So coming out of this, we have one positive and one negative that go into our breaker box and then into a uh, solar controller. So the solar controller is, I saw this from a guy Derek Howell, I think his name is. He has a project called DIY Homestead and um, he's living off the grid in southern Arizona <clears throat> I think maybe somewhere between uh, Tucson and Phoenix and he has he's stationary but he's got a little tiny house and he has a really cool setup and he did amazing videos and I saw his solar controller and some of his other equipment and they were all Schneider so I kind of checked into that and that looked like really great manufacturer for um, these products so the like solar controller is a Schneider MPPT 60150, and those refer to the 60 is how much amps it can handle, and the 150 is how many volts. And uh, can I add those. really quick, these aren't rated for mobile, and we don't actually know what the consequences are <laughs> of having a system that isn't rated for mobile. Um, since we've only been driving for a month, we'll be able to report back and let um, everybody know how it goes. You, there's an actual, there's a different classifications for rating things based on safety and on how it was built. And so these weren't rated for mobile, so they weren't rated for maybe the vibrations or maybe the, like, I think that there's potentially a number of different things to be concerned about with that. There um, is a significant amount of vibration in here and we have the engine running. Right, vibration and then just bumps, bumps and stuff that we're going over. So we're kind of, I'm nervous about us going over a bump and uh, like something internally just breaking um, because it wasn't those kinds of just jerking and stuff. So we'll see, you know, I didn't realize that until after we were like the system was built. So the reality of it is, is like, we're here now. We're just going to kind of deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, troubleshoot as we go. You kind of figure it out as you go and then you make adjustments and that's life. So I came back up the power from the solar controller just kind of manages the solar um, and how much it produces and it gets it into a state that it can be then used to put it into your batteries. So from there it goes back into the breaker box and then we have a hole right underneath our breaker box that goes into our storage bay on this side of the bus and, uh, and we have a, a battery set up down there. What we did is um, we we're originally gonna build like a Tesla DIY uh, battery, do-it-yourself battery power wall, which they make it look really cool. You can see all the YouTube videos of people doing these, these do-it-yourself um, power walls. The problem is finding the little batteries that go inside of them. So they're called 18650s and they look kind of like AA batteries and you get like, you know, a thousand or 2000 of them together. And then you can like build out this really cool lithium ion battery. The unfortunate part is it's hard to find those now, those 18650 cells, because there's so many people building these batteries that the price has gone up and the quantity um, available has gone down. So I actually purchased a bunch of them and when I got them, they weren't the amps that they claimed that they were. So I so sent those back and then in kind of a rush to figure out like what are our alternatives, I looked at like maybe getting a used Tesla battery like from a salvage Tesla. Unfortunately, I couldn't build that to fit with our system, so I looked at some of the other uh, electric cars and I found a Nissan Leaf would work for us. So I called around, fortunately in my town, uh, there's a salvage yard and they had the access to use Nissan Leaf from a salvage vehicle, had 40,000 miles on it already. So we got that and we tore that apart and there's 48 modules in those uh, Nissan Leaf batteries. It was from a 2012 Nissan Leaf. So there's 48 modules, you take it all apart, you get them into the individual like bricks 
and then we build it back up according to what I needed here, how many volts I needed. So we have right now six different batteries that have seven modules in them each. So that's 42 of the 48 we're using right now. And then we just have six extra in case something were to happen to one of them. And right now we only have one of the batteries hooked up. We only have one of the bricks hooked up, but in the end we'll have all six of them kind of built together in parallel. And that will be about 20 kilowatts of uh, storage space. So we have about 2,700 watts on the roof and we'll have about 20,000 watts in our battery bank to be able to store all the solar that gets produced. The modules themselves in each of our bricks are wired in series and then the battery bricks together are wired in parallel. So that's a lot of information. <laughs> and researching all of that took months and a lot of stress. I aged a couple of years. So I know some some people, so actually the, the DIY homestead guy and the guy who helped him um, have actually written a lot of material. Um, so I thought about, because I still feel like a novice in all of this. I don't feel like I, I know nearly enough to, I know enough to make myself dangerous and with the electricity that is a dangerous thing. So I feel like if I were to, to help somebody else, I would want to like know more. So I've thought about teaming up with those guys. They actually um, have created some really great material and I thought it would be cool to like digitize it and help them make it into like something that people could go online and use. And that would utilize what I'm good at, which is software uh, and what they're good at, which is this stuff. Um, so I learned a lot from them and other people too, just been invaluable resources. So once the power's in the battery, then pretty straightforward. It comes back into our breaker box and into our inverter. This is the Schneider uh, 6848. So the first number is how many watts it's capable of outputting at a constant discharge. So 6800 is the number of watts that it can output constantly. It can go up to 8500 watts for a one hour surge and it can go to 12,000 watts for a 60 second surge. Um, so it's able to, hand, able to handle a lot of power. 48 is the number of volts that this is rated to. Essentially, your, your battery bank needs to be around a 48 volt nominal system to be able to invert this. So I don't know how to better explain that, but first number is how many watts it's capable of outputting and the second number, the second number, the 48 is the volt. This then runs everything inside of our bus. It is our lights, our outlets, our heat, our, it eventually will be our air conditioning, stovetop, whatever, all the stuff that we have. One day it will be our hot water heater and potentially our charging for our electric car. Right, so that's just become standard like household stuff. You can see a lot of really great videos online for that, but essentially just hooking up a main panel. You've got your wires to your devices. So here we have on it washer dryer, and this is a Romex wire. This would be 12 gauge wire considered like 12 two. And this is what you would hook up anything under 20 amps be this guy. You just do we, standard wiring from here. We divided the bus into like four quadrants. So all of our outlets in each of the four quadrants have a dedicated circuit. And then a few have a dedicated circuit if they consume more energy. So mm -hmm. our refrigerator has a dedicated, our washer dryer, I think our stove does as well. The stove is actually 240. Mm -hmm. um, and I should just really quickly note, if you're gonna get an electric cooktop with at least two burners, you need at least 240 or you won't be able to boil water on one while cooking on the other. So critical tip there. And then you can sort of see here, electrical runs in the ceiling. We tried not to run any wires in the floor just because all the construction and the fastening of our framing and stuff we didn't want to accidentally puncture something but we did run into an issue with the ceiling when we were putting in these finishing boards that we punctured our wire to our water heater which is really big uh, and the way that we repaired that is we kind of had to peel some foam out pull out that wire and then use mastic tape which is a rubber tape to seal it up and and fix it it's not fun when you hit something or it's not working i can imagine if we hit a wire now we would have to tear a lot of stuff out so going in the ceiling with the wires was probably a good choice 
Obviously, we're only about 65% complete, and this will not look like this when it's done. Um, the bed will be centered on this platform, which I think is about 19 inches off the ground. We have two 110 gallon water tanks underneath the bed, and this will actually be pushed back a significant amount as well, all the way back to the wall back there. Uh, so this will be centered, and then we'll have kind of some space down the edge, which will make getting in and out of the bed easier without disturbing each other, have a little bit more room, making the bed will be easier, and we have some outlets in the walls, put some drapes up that look nice. The water tanks have some space behind them, so the water tanks will hook to, I don't remember the specific order, I have it all written down, but we have an accumulation tank, I think that is five gallons, which will prevent our water pump, pump from like constantly running when you turn the water on. So when we take a shower, or Nick, what do we think that we would use? Like uh, so more than five gallons, but. Yeah, so we're estimating like a seven minute shower. I can't remember how much, but it'll prevent the pump from running and wearing the pump down was the goal. So we have a water pump back there, an accumulation tank, some miscellaneous hoses and stuff for filling the tanks. And then those hoses, pretty much just one blue PEX line runs all the way to the front and then the plumbing kind of is roughed in up front. So we have 14 windows on each side and we only removed two. We removed the two behind the shower. I would say advice on this, if you're gonna be in a cold climate and try to heat the interior, you should take the windows out and put something in that's more efficient. We haven't experienced super hot weather yet, so we're not sure how inefficient they'll be. Let's go check out the roof rack and the solar panels and some of the other exterior things. So we're outside. We're just gonna go through a couple of the things that we did to the outside of the bus to, I don't know, just get it ready so that we could hit the road. In Wisconsin, we had a couple things that we had to do. Um, this is the same in a few states, at least most states, I think. Uh, we had to have all the yellow painted. We had to have the uh, stop arm removed. And then we also had to have the upper flashing lights uh, removed and those holes had to be covered. Um, so once you do that, then they approve you or like uh, certify you that you are uh, no longer a school bus. And then we have to send that in with our other information to get it titled as a motorhome. These requirements are very state specific, so. If you have the option to pick a state that has more lenient laws, then go that route for sure. With the electrical panel, we we pretty much just pulled out wires. We didn't really add anything into it. We did actually break one of the solenoids, um, one of the connections to the solenoids. And what we found is that because we'd removed so much stuff that we were actually able to route the wires that were being used on that one solenoid through a different place. So it ended up working out for us in the long run. We are, we're good. Um, we don't have to like do a whole lot in there. It was a kind of intricate process to figure out which wires we needed. So all the wires on the inside were bundled together. We unwrapped all of that and took out each wire that we didn't need to clean it up. Right, that, that took time and it was good though. I think it was essential, like get rid of all that unnecessary wire in the bus and just clean it up and make sure you know what's what so that if you do have a problem later down the road, you're not like going through things and trying to figure out, uh, you know, why does this break? Like which wire is it, all of that. So we probably took out, like I said, maybe half of the wires, maybe more, maybe 60% of the wires that were in there that were unnecessary, that were essential for the bus as it was, but because we took out lights and because we took out the stop arm and all that stuff, the emergency exit sounds and um, all of those alarms, that just wasn't a problem for us. Right. So that was all the wiring. Um, we also built the roof rack. We designed the roof rack and then Natasha's dad, Dana, did all the welding for it. So that was a big process. <laughs> First couple of weeks yeah. was that. So one of the choices we had to make is how far from the roof, like the peak of the roof would the rack be? Um, ours is five inches. I wish I would have done maybe just another inch or two so I can get underneath to paint and uh, fix any rust spots. It's really tough for us to fit under there right now. Um, another thing that we might add in the future is a windbreak in the front up here because the wind goes underneath the rack 
and the, pa the panels shake, that's not good for the panels. If they do get damaged, uh, we're told that we'll be able to see, visibly see if they're damaged from the top of the panel, but it's very possible that that could happen from the wind. We decided that we wanted to be able to tilt the panels up, and the only way that we were gonna be able to do that is if we push them to one side and then put them on kind of a hinge mechanism. Um, so we have a catwalk on this side where we can walk along each of the panels and we can actually like unscrew them. We haven't done it yet. We don't have the, the tilting mechanism finished. But once we do, we'll be able to walk along and we'll be able to unscrew them and tilt them up so that we can optimize the angle of the panels and get the most uh, possible sun depending on what uh, time of year it is. So if it's winter, we need a little bit steeper angle. If it's summer, we probably don't need much angle depending on, again, the time of year and, and the location, like where we're continent. The solar mount is essentially a piece of angle, slotted angle steel attached to the panel, and then another attached to the bus, the, well, the roof rack, and there's just a bolt as a hinge. I don't think I'd recommend for people to copy our strategy. It wasn't flexible enough when we were putting it together to be an easy process at all is really tough. Do some exploration, like prototype or something, figure it out. I think it'll work for us, but it was really hard to implement. Two thirds of the bus are panels, and then we have a third in the back for stargazing, which I did when we were in Quartzsite and the stars were beautiful. Stargazing, we watched a parade up there in New Orleans. Um, just anything we want to do kind of privately. It also feels safe if we wanted to sleep up there. We're away from any critter, critters that could get us on the ground. It's like our default hangout spot, yeah. you know, if we're traveling somewhere and we just pause and we want to see the town a little bit different, so. I, I just want to mention like the paint and we took the windows and stuff out. So as far as painting this beast, chose an airless sprayer so we didn't need an air compressor and we didn't have to thin it or anything. Prep, I'm gonna warn everybody, prep takes so long, three times as long as it takes to spray it. But um, we removed all the windows as a part of the prep because there was water leaking down into the walls, which will cause rust. Taking them out wasn't too big of a process. We did some scraping, we cleaned them up. I'd recommend if you take them out, polish them up. There's no reason not to. We just use steel wool and I think they're called SOS cleaning pads. They have like a little bit of soap on it to lube it up a little bit and they're really shiny now. So um, that took off like the corrosion and stuff. Yeah and then we we did some taping. We sanded everything that was rusty down to shiny metal and primed it. So what you see here is just a primer. Uh, we use a Rust-Oleum oil-based product which is better for out door application and I think we're actually going to change our route on the top coat so we were going to use a rust only enamel which is what we used on our roof rack and it takes a week to cure it takes days to dry and I'm afraid that it's going to get dust and just get damaged so we're, we're going to look at a three-part primer and um, a water-based top coat option later. On the roof we used an elastomeric, it's like an RV coating to keep out some of that heat. Uh, it's also, it seals it too, so if we had any leaks it kind of patches it up. still have a bucket with us, it's like a five gallon bucket of it. The problem with it is it's really uh, thin and you have to put on like 50 coats for it to be like... I thought it would be perfect. thick and rubbery, but it's thin. We did like seven coats. It's working okay. We have a lot of footprints because we did more work on the roof after we'd put it on. So we have to go back and like touch it up and just kind of make it look nice. Yeah. So the underbody storage boxes took me a couple weeks to design these things because I didn't have a lot of knowledge. Um, I was initially going to use slotted angle steel as a frame and then bolt in somehow or rivet in walls to the boxes. But it turns out I had a cousin who works at a manufacturing place, which I probably shouldn't mention. Um, but what he did is he got a large piece of sheet metal and was able to bend it in several locations. So we have a solid sheet for the underbody box and then some end caps that are welded in. He also had a frame, a thick two 
two inch um, angle steel frame uh, welded onto it as well so it's really strong we had quite a bit of trouble trying to determine what the doors would be so what you're seeing now is kind of a temporary solution to get us on the road quickly we use plywood uh, with some MDF decorative trim which I would not recommend or use again because it expands when it absorbs water. And we just used a deadbolt lock that we got keyed all the same from a locksmith, a local one in Winona. They, you push the door in and then you twist the deadbolt and it holds it pretty securely. I put a weather strip all the way uh, along the edges to keep the water out. And it's been pretty good so far. We can't really say for sure because we have some, some gaps along the back that we haven't sealed on the inside that let water in and then some little holes where bolts go that we haven't filled so but for the most part it's been awesome it's a critical piece in our design these underbody boxes it holds our all of our plumbing on this side of the bus our gray water tank is probably I think it's like 96 inches long or something the sink drain the washer dryer drain the bathtub drain shower and then another sink drain for the bathroom all go down in there into that one tank and then we're also planning to put in an outdoor shower down there as well that you can just open up and pull out so we don't have to store some of that water for the shower um, and then on the other side we have electrical storage underneath there so keeping that watertight is really critical we just plan to put plastic bins in there for anything we store just in case there is a leak it's all insulated and each bin has a heating mat in there to keep it warm from freezing and it's not going to keep it like really warm just a little bit above uh, freezing yep especially for the water uh, we figured you know if it's cold for an extended period of time we just turn that on and that should keep that water from freezing up and we can still have gray water in there and it won't be a problem the thermostats are inside and then each, well not each mat, each thermostat has a sensor so we know what the temp is. And it's not, I don't think it's a traditional application of the Thermosoft mats that we used. So we'll have to see if they actually survive. You're not supposed to put a permanently installed fixture over top because it can overheat. So we'll see if they... I'm not worried about them overheating because the only time that we're actually gonna run them is if it gets below uh, freezing for an extended period of time. So uh, I don't think it's gonna, I don't think it'll ever overheat in that instance. Um, the other part of uh, the storage boxes, so she, her cousin uh, actually fabricated them and then we took the, the bus to him and we were able to go in a shop in like at the beginning of the year and uh, and install them. So we cut out a little piece of the skirt and then installed them. That process was really smooth. It was probably the smoothest thing that we did on the bus just as far as like any major project goes. That installation was like eight hours and just easy the entire time and everything just went according to plan. It was great. And the end result is the boxes are absolutely amazing. So he did a really great job with fabrication and made it easy for us to install them. So that was awesome. Yeah, Nick cut out a little piece here for the skirt right. out of, so we removed that panel on the inside that the seats connect to, which we now realize is a structural piece and you should not take out. I'm just warning everybody of that. We took that out, so we reused some of the metal for this little decorative piece here that kind of helps it all flow together. It is also holding the box in place a little bit. And if you haven't tried riveting, you have to because it's really awesome. It's really fun. So we have an Instagram, we have a Facebook. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, YouTube, and our handle is Uproot and Rome. Um, we probably should say thank you to all the people that helped us because this was not us, just us. Like this right. was a huge project. Our parents were like the biggest help for us. They did money, they did food, they did time on the bus, they did, you know, all the different things to support us to get us to, to be here, as well as a lot of our friends and family just loaning tools or time or like effort. It was amazing the amount of support that we've gotten on this. This was not an easy project. It's like I say, like we built a house in a short amount of time, like six, seven months, like we built a house. There's no way that we could have done that without um, everybody that, that lent a hand. So, so that was good. We're thankful.